in um, the city that's colonially known, known as Vancouver. These are the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slail with Tooth peoples. Um, and I used to lead at Kwersanga all the time, and I've been taking a little bit of a break because I've been working really hard at building Sangha in Vancouver over here. So we, we have our very sweet sibling Sangha, um, Kwersanga over here. Um, yeah. Okay, so a little bit about me. Um, so I I come to this work as a longtime practitioner. Um, and then um, I did a program with actually several of the people who are here in this room through True North Insight, which is the organization that hosts Kaur Sangha or that houses Kaur Sangha, I guess. Um, I did a mentorship program with them that kind of helped me to hone some skills to be able to offer this to, to offer this with you today. Um, and then I've also done um, a fair amount of training in somatic experiencing, and both of those traditions will be um, kind of what I'm leading with today, or, or how I'm understanding um, how to sustain presence with Palestine today. Okay, so it's really important to me that you take care of yourself in whatever way you need. You may have just logged on and been, been like, oh, thought queer sangha is just going to breathe with some people. And now I'm hearing that I'm, we're going to be talking about Palestine. And if that's not your jam and you need to leave, that's totally fine. If you need to mute me or close your screen or all the different ways we um, kind of titrate how much we want to take in are absolutely welcome to you. Okay. And also, um, I'm going to type in my email in the chat here. Um, and I'm going to be talking about something that is a little bit contentious or a little bit maybe challenging for some people. And as particularly, if, particularly if you're from those regions, if you're impacted directly, um, and you have some feedback for me, I absolutely welcome it. Um, even if it's absolutely opposite to what I'm saying, I can hold it with, with a big Buddhist heart as we try to do with our with our compassion practices. Um, so if that feels safe for you, I would I would love to hear from you. Um, so that's my email. Okay. So I wanted to start with a practice. So you can choose a posture that will um, allow you to turn inwards with ease. So that might be sitting, standing, or lying down. And turning your attention inwards. And we'll start by really paying attention to the earth and how the earth is supporting us. So noticing the parts of your body that are in contact with the earth. This might be your seat and your feet, your thighs. It might be parts of your back body, leaning against a chair or lying down. And really letting yourself sink in here. knowing that you don't have to do anything at all to deserve the support of the earth. It's just here for you. And see if you can feel into the weight, the weightiness of gravity. Perhaps your shoulders roll back and down. Maybe your jaw drops a little bit. You 
can think of the earth holding us like a caregiver holds an infant. With delight. A real grounded ease. Letting ourselves be held in this way. Feeling into that gravitational pull. Knowing that it's the earth calling us home. And so we'll place one hand on the belly and one hand on the heart. Feeling into the temperature of the hands and the pressure as well. Noticing and when minds do what minds do and wander, we gently bring our attention back to the hands, back to the belly and chest. We'll take one hand and put it right at the base of our skull here. And then the other hand will go right on the forehead. We can imagine our two hands are having a conversation with each other. And the conversation is about, there are no words in this conversation. Heart, just energy. And we'll place one hand back on the heart and the other hand on the cheek. Again, allowing your 
space to be cradled just like a caregiver would cradle a child or like you would hold a baby bird. And then dropping the hands gently. And staying with the breath and just noticing what feels different. Thanks everyone. You can turn your attention back outwards. So it's quite a long Dharma talk. <laughs> I'm not very good at being in the chat when this is happening. So if there's something that's happening in the chat, if someone wants to alert me to that, that would be so great. Um, okay. So I wanted to ground today's practice with, um, or today's talking part, listening practice, I guess, with the Plum Village tradition's understanding of the first precept, which is about not causing harm. So the precepts are the values that the Buddha prescribed to us as lay people on how to be in right relationship with each other, um, and also to ourselves and the land to support us on this path towards enlightenment. So I will post this in the chat. Okay. Reverence for life. Aware of the suffering caused by the destruction of life, I am committed to cultivating the insight of interbeing and compassion and learning ways to protect the lives of people, animals, plants, and minerals. I am determined not to kill, not to let others kill, and not to support any act of killing in the world, in my thinking or in my way of life. Seeing that harmful actions arise from anger, fear, greed, and intolerance, which in turn come from dualistic and discriminative thinking, I will cultivate openness, non-discrimination, and non-attachment to views in order to transform violence, fanaticism, and dogmatism in myself and in the world. Hmm. So it's clear from a Buddhist lens that it's important that we respond to suffering when we see it happening. And there is a lot of suffering happening right now, you know? Um, not just in Palestine, but in, in the Sudan and Congo and in many other places in the world, including, of course, the ongoing violence that's happening here towards indigenous people, the consistency of anti-Black racism. And it was just Trans Day of Remembrance. So we know, right, there's been a huge anti-trans backlash that's been happening. Not to mention the climate chaos that is a consistent part of our lives these days. And then of course, the deep rise in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia that's happening everywhere. So it really is a time of trying to be with mass, mass death and mass migration, what's happening because of this genocide, grief, unrelenting trauma, profound fear, polarization and anger, and so, so much heartbreak. But, you know, like, that's how we're supposed to feel. We're supposed to feel profoundly heartbroken. It's heartbreaking what's happening, right? There's that quote somewhere that I'm not going to get right about how the amount of grief we feel is a measure of how much we love. 
something like that. And that really rings true. You know, and many of us have been in the streets. We've been supporting our dear ones who are directly impacted, our Jewish and Palestinian friends and loved ones. We've been fundraising, we've been praying, we've been learning and doing all the social media scrolling and posting and reposting and, um, you know, calling our politicians for some of us daily. And, and we've been feeling so much, right? So much feeling. And of course, those who are directly impacted by this are feeling this in a, in a much deeper way than I could as someone who, um, who isn't connected to those regions. But also for so many of us, our own histories, our own causes and conditions, some of that stuff is getting stirred up, right? Coming from people who've been colonized or maybe coming from people who have done colonizing, that kind of stuff can get really stirred up in this moment too. And this is on top of our already very full lives, right? So it can be a real recipe for burnout. And that, you know, the main kind of call to action that we've been getting is to bear witness, to keep looking, to not turn away. And, and so then it seems weird, right, to even be thinking in the smallest way about our own personal burnout, our own personal, like, feelings of discomfort. It might feel, like, frivolous, um, yeah, or selfish even. And this is because we deeply, you know, center ourselves and believe in this first precept, right? We believe in ending suffering for all beings or what is co more colloquially known as justice, right? beautiful, beautiful that we want to orient towards that, towards bearing witness. But in order to do that, we need to be well-resourced, right? It's a lot to hold. So in the West, our understanding of care, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a funny conception of care. It's like this finite resource, right? We have this much care and I can allot care to other people, but it's at the expense of myself. So if there's all of this stuff happening in the world and I'm trying to hold it all in the heart of compassion or just like, I'm just trying to care, I'm trying to do that, but I'm, uh, in order to do that, I have to take away some care for myself in order to, you know, plop some of that finite care into other, into other people. So then if I'm experiencing any kind of aversion or no energy or any kind of like, this is difficult, I don't know how to be with it. If that's arising, then the way that we sometimes deal with that is by saying, okay, I'm going to take some care away from you and I'm going to plop it back into my bucket of care, you know? And that's how we end up with this real dualistic idea of like these really um, kind of hyper individualistic notions of self care, like taking a bubble bath. You know, we've all heard these things. Um, and then we don't know how to kind of hold that with this message of, of don't look away, please bear witness to what's happening. We don't know how to do both of those because this Western conceptualization of care is so pervasive. But Buddhism really does away with that, that false dichotomy. It's not about looking away, it's about looking skillfully. And what we mean by that in a Buddhist context is does this, do, does this type of looking help decrease suffering? So in Buddhist traditions, if we're not including ourselves in compassion practices, then we are not actually being truly compassionate, right? Because compassion is a wish that all beings are free from suffering. And for those of us with anti-capitalist and disability justice values, this smells really, really nicely, right? We don't push ourselves into producing endlessly, into looking endlessly, into like just grinding ourselves into the ground. That is not disability justice. That is not anti-capitalism. And that certainly is not compassion. The Buddhist conception of compassion can hold, can hold it all. It's described as boundless, as limitless. And at least in my body, the way that I experience compassion is that it has a real steady presence. You know, it isn't this like kind of um, 
the heart being pulled left and right, it's kind of, it's more steady than that. And it actually for me feels like a little bit of a wave. Like I can feel into the suffering and that feels like an arising. And then there's an opening and the opening is steady. And it's actually kind of pleasant, you know, actually feels really lovely. There's a tenderness in it. It's not just joy. There's, it's, it's a whole separate feeling. So compassion is a way that our heart can break open, can break open in the face of suffering. And it really moves us to action. I got a teaching last couple of weeks ago about compassion. Um, uh, Rachel Lewis, who, who co-teaches the Vancouver Sangha with me, was sharing about how when they put monks in those MRI machines and they're like, what happens to their brains when they're practicing compassion? The parts of the body, the parts of the brain that light up around movement, like the limbs get activated as well, because compassion is about action. It's not just about feeling, it's about moving and doing something. Gregory Boyle puts it like this. Oh, I'm going to try to put all the quotes in the chat just because quotes can be hard to pay attention to. Okay. Gregory Boyle puts it like this. Compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded, or in this case, the wounded and the witness. It's a covenant between equals. Compassion is always at its most authentic about a shift from the cramped world of self-preoccupation into a more expansive place of fellowship and of true kinship. So that's the, that's that's how we want to be with suffering, right? We want to be with su suffering with a boundless, limitless heart of compassion. So that's the ideal. <laughs> and then we get hooked, right? We get hooked by aversion all the time or we get hooked by clinging all the time. So what does that look like? To me, that's really this idea of the heart breaking closed instead of breaking open, right? Um, so it can look like so many different ways. Um, and all of these, these ways I think have shown up for many of us um, in this time of, of witnessing. So it can look like minimization and denial, right? That's not happening, right? I'm, that's, it's just too much. I'm not going to, I'm not going to deal with it. It's too much it's over there. So there's like, a, there can be some, some numbness and some collapse that happens, right? So this kind of energy leaning back and sinking down and just, it's too much. So I just need to escape it by not, by not being with it. And then another way we don't want to be with it, another way that that not wanting to be with it can show, can show up is through um, this kind of leaning forward energy, this energy of wanting to fix it, you know, wanting to, to make things better without really being with it first. Because we're, what we're aversive to is what's happening in our bodies, right? We're witnessing all of this violence. It's so overwhelming. And we're just like, ah, oh, you know, I don't really want to feel that, right? So sometimes it might look like, I'm just going to watch a bunch of TV shows so I don't have to be with what's here. I'm going to eat a bunch of delicious food so I don't have to be with what's here. And none of that's bad. Like, it's not like, oh, you're bad for not wanting to be with what's here. It's just not... Um, it's not looking skillfully. And that's what we're really trying to hone in on today, bearing witness skillfully. So this wanting to fix it energy, um, that that one is definitely my jam. Um, that's, that's my go-to. <laughs> so um, pretty quick after October 7th, I was in a panic state that a lot of us were in and I was like, okay, I'm having all these big feelings. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix my feelings. And I'm going to do that by action, right? And there's this way that I can trick myself by being like, ah, compassion is action. Great. I'm just going to act. But I didn't really pause first, you know, I just kind of wanted to act. So I run a jewelry business. I make like radical leftist jewelry and I make words with wire. And so I started making a bunch of like free Palestine earrings and it's like, cool, I'm going to do a fundraiser. I'm going to raise money. This is what I always do. This is my first line of action whenever there's injustice. Cool, cool. I'm doing this. And with, and then I posted it. And then immediately I got a bunch of messages from people being like, oh, sweetheart, there's no aid going into Gaza right now. What are you fundraising for? And this is what happens when you're trying to fix the feelings before 
I've actually felt them through and grounded and was like, what is wise action here? How can I actually be of support, right? So in nervous system terms, um, we can talk about this as being out of our window of tolerance. Um, and really that just means that we're in some kind of fight, flight, or freeze energy. A lot of us have, know about that. And, and, you know, there's varying degrees of this. It's not like, um, you know, sometimes you can, you can be both here and also in some fight, flight energy. It's not like one or the other. So it's a spectrum. And when we feel into that energy in the body, it often feels pretty uncomfortable. There's like tightness or like restlessness or all kinds of difficult feelings in the body. And when we're in that kind of survival energy, we are not in a relational place. And again, this is a spectrum, right? So we can, might have some access to relationality, but not a lot. We're not really in a place of deep understanding. We don't really have the capacity for deep listening, right? we're much more likely to polarize in those places and be like, those people are bad, these people are good, right? That kind of thing. And that kind of polarization, those states are the, are really states of hatred, right? And that hatred, that those my heart mind states is what allows the kind of genocidal thinking to even happen, right? So it's really, really important as people who are far away from this, that we do what we can to try to stay within our windows, to try to work with, to try to be present with aversion so that we're not acting from a place of hatred, so that we are with aversion instead of weaponizing aversion. Because that can, that's what can often happen if we're not present with it. Okay, so how do we work with aversion? Um, first, we pause, right? So if I had paused before I started making a bunch of jewelry, things would have been different. So when um, this, a couple of days after October 7th, I was so lucky to, to um, have been in Sangha. Um, there was some, some of us who are here in this room today, we're all in Sangha together for a couple of days on a retreat where we were doing a bunch of talking. And so we just spent two days, but I guess three days with each other, really just being in the shock of this of being like, what, how do we even, how do we even understand what's happening? And one of our dear Sangha members, um, Shada Jai, suggested that we pause, but that we pause militantly. We pause militantly. And if military language is like, well, you can think of this as a pause of justice. So when we're lost in the waves of greed, hatred, confusion, we're really in those waves and we forget that we are the ocean. We're not able to see clearly from those places. When we act from those places, as I said earlier, when we're in those non-relational places, we can cause more suffering. So the first thing we do is pause and let ourselves feel those waves, right? And this, this pause is not a place of this kind of, this like collapse or despair or this like leaning forward place of rage and, and um, or, or wanting to fix it, you know? It's really a pause, this like more middle spine upright, deep dignity kind of pause. That's what I mean by militant. It's a pause that allows us to be with ourselves before we act so we act in wise ways. It's really resting in a place of justice. When you don't have any idea what to do and you don't know what's happening and there's so much happening, we can always come back to that first precept and rest there. Okay. So first we can pause militantly or, or pause in justice. Second, we can use our mindfulness practice, right? This is what we practice for. So sometimes we talk about mindfulness as being like a bird there are two wings to the bird, wisdom and compassion. And in order for the bird to fly, we need both wisdom and compassion. So if we're feeling into that aversion, into any kind of pushing it away energy, 
that's showing up as collapse or as fixing it or any permutation of aversion or just no, you know, um, let yourself feel it, let yourself feel it fully. But it's really important that we offer compassion to ourselves because it's a difficult thing to feel, right? And this is not at the expense of compassion for, um, for people in Palestine, you know? Compassion can actually hold it all. Compassion can hold the suffering of the Israeli hostages too. You know, so often on the left, we're like, I can only feel compassion for this group of people so that I act in the right way, right? But actually compassion can hold everything. And then we can make decisive actions based on the pause of justice, but we can hold everybody. Okay. This can be really hard to do. <laughs> if it was easy, we wouldn't need to practice, right? It could be really challenging. So, I, so I'm going to tell you a one-line story, and I just want you to tune inwards as you hear it. So I have a friend who's really, or at least two weeks ago, they're in a different place now, but two weeks ago was really, really caught, really, really caught in this, in the depth of suffering. And the way that their aversion was showing up was a deep aversion to aliveness and, a, and a, a just, just not wanting to, just really feeling like merging with the pain of Palestinians was the only way forward. So I said to them, hey friend, maybe we can go for a walk in nature and just be with some, some forest kin, you know? Ask the forest to hold this with us. And my friend said, how can I be in nature right now when the olive trees in Palestine have been burned down? And see if right now you can feel that wave of compassion in your chest. And how you didn't have to do anything at all to feel that, it just arose naturally. And see if you can feel how that compassion feels different than the kind of aversion that my friend is feeling. Mm. <clears throat> yes, so mindfulness. It's our it's our guiding tool in everything, right? Okay. A third thing we can do is we can surrender. We can surrender to the fact that suffering is happening. And we can give up we can give up on trying to control the outcomes, you know? This does not mean that we give up on action. We give up on the idea on the idea that we have any control over if our actions will have the impact we want them to. This is also known as grieving, right? So grief for our governments for not calling a ceasefire, grief for the loss of life, grief for polarization, for our own inability to show up in the ways we want to in every minute. This is how we allow our heart to break open instead of shutting down. And we keep, we keep acting anyway. You know, this is the practice. This is what it's like to meditate, right? So, so often when we're new at, at meditating, we're like, oh, I'm not getting it right because my mind keep, keeps wandering. But that's the path. <laughs> the mind wanders. We just keep bringing it back. And we do this for hours, for weeks, for months, for lifetimes, you know? We just, and we're not like, you know, after a while, we're like, ah, okay, the, this is, this is the work. The work is to just keep bringing the mind back. I'm not failing. Just like how we keep calling and we keep calling and we keep calling. We are not failing. We are, we are doing what's right, right? We're resting in that sense of justice and acting and letting go of the outcomes. We want to make sure that when we're grieving, we do so without judging it or pushing it away. I've been thinking a lot about grief and I always turn to Lama Rado Owens when I'm thinking about grief because he's kind of a grief genius. So I'll post a quote here. 
Brokenheartedness is a composite experience that holds other experiences like pain, aching, frustration, loneliness, or even anger. Sometimes I describe heartbrokenness as an expression of deep disappointment that wants to be taken care of. Mourning is how I, is how I take care of my broken heart because above all, my broken heart wants to be seen, held, and experienced, just like we want to be as well by other people. Mourning is my attempt to acknowledge brokenheartedness, accept it, and offer it space to be in my experience so it may do its work of teaching me and passing through. Okay. Another way, another way to be with aversion is to commit to being spiritual warriors, right? And by that, I just mean committing to our practice, even when it's difficult. We commit to being present with what's here as it's here as best as we can with so much compassion, you know? So really what that requires is, re is renunciating, trying to feel better, right? Trusting that, can, that compassion can hold it all. I really like what this Instagram account um, dismantling the master's tools says. Again, I'll post it in the chat. What is being asked of us in this moment is to bear witness and to be moved to action by what we are seeing. In order to do so in this time of mass genocide, we need to shift from a paradigm of practicing towards feeling better to practicing towards feeling more. We cannot resist what we can't feel. Yeah, we cannot resist what we can't feel. And you know, feeling more isn't always feeling more of the same. We don't know what's going to happen when we open to what's here. It might be something different um, and it might be more of what's difficult. We just don't know. And that's the commitment to being a spiritual warrior is to open to what's here, not knowing being in this groundlessness, not having any idea what's going to happen. So my friend who said like, I can't, I can't go into the forest, it's too hard. I just need to be with the deep suffering. That friend, when we were, we were having like, um, we were in Sangha together and they were just about to go home. And I was like, on your, on your bike ride home, can you just let yourself, can you let yourself feel the suffering that you're feeling, which is so beautiful, right? such a deep desire to wanna to be with the difficulty, but can you also feel your pedals, your feet on the pedals? And can you also feel the wind in your hair? And can you also notice that the leaves are falling? Can you be with all of it? And we do that not to cover over the pain, right? Not to add to aversion. We do it to make space for what's here so that it can be held in a container of kindness. And we, you know, it's really, really, really important that we do this in a trauma-informed way, right? We can just say all we want, like, just be with what's difficult. Like if we could do that, we would just do it. But we don't wanna overwhelm ourselves. We don't wanna go into those survival strategies and then we end up in non-relational places and then we're causing harm. No, we don't wanna do any of that. So it's really, really, really important that we do this in a trauma-informed way. We can't hold genocide on our own. We just can't. I am so lucky that I live in a beautiful place the ocean is just a few minutes away from me. And when I feel overwhelmed by grief, I ask the ocean to hold it with me. The ocean is huge. I am so small. The ocean can hold it in a way that I cannot, you know, and the ocean is already doing it. All I have to do is tap into the fact that that's already happening, you know? Mm -hmm. Another thing we can do is broaden the container within. So very often when we're feeling this deep distress, we feel it in our heart center, our diaphragm and in our belly. And we can actually ask, um, we can ask our whole body to hold it, right? Can, can my toes hold this too? That kind of thing. And if that's, that's too small of a container, great. Can the earth hold it? Can the earth hold this with me? 
you know, when the Buddha was, was um, under the Bodhi tree and sitting for enlightenment and Mara was there throwing all of these things that him, making things really, really difficult for him. He touched the earth and asked the earth to bear witness to, to what was happening to him. And if the Buddha needs support, I think we might need support too, you know? It, we can ask the earth to hold this with us. I had this, um, this practice. Um, I do a lot of ritual in my life. And I had this practice right at the beginning days when I was really in the waves and had no idea that I was the ocean, no idea. I, I would go out and I'd um, just sort of set the intention to, um, to find the suffering in an object on the ground. And so I'd find, an, I'd find I found a little rock and then I dig a little hole in the earth and I would place the rock in. It's just a way to symbolize, you know, this um, returning all of these really big feelings in my body back to the earth where it can be composted. Okay, so that's resourcing. We can also resource without like that. So those are some suggestions of resourcing um, kind of externally, but we can also resource without looking away, right? We can find joy in Palestinian culture and resistance and resilience. So like just the level of joy that I have looking at these, at all of the images of the demonstrations, right? And seeing the resistance and seeing people surviving through all of this. It's so beautiful if you can let yourself feel into it. So again, it's not about looking away. It's about looking differently. I've been going to a lot of demonstrations. I'm sure that's true for many of us. Um, lots of protests. And um, there are so many ways to practice when we're marching, because what else is a march other than a walking meditation, right? So sometimes when I'm overwhelmed, for me, often I get, I'm like a very teary person. I can cry at the drop of a hat and I don't really want to take up space with a bunch of my tears while I'm there. So, okay, huge compassion. How beautiful, so beautiful, beautiful quality in, in this being. And also a little bit of a loss of equanimity, right? Having trouble finding that steadiness. And so I can... Um, I can let go of the free Palestine chanting that I'm doing and I can focus on the earth and just go, you know, walking and naming earth, earth, earth. And, you know, I live in Vancouver, so I can look over at the mountains that are, you know, a really very typical um, symbol of equanimity, right? And that reminds me, ah, yes, I can be, I can have a heart of compassion and be steady as well. And there's a real interdependence too at marches where if I'm noting and naming and going silent, I'm dropping the chants, knowing fully well that the entire group is chanting. I don't have to do it in that moment because there's a whole crew of people who've got my, who've got this back, who've got, who has the back of justice, you know, I can drop this so I can do that. And I can focus in on relationality, right? When we're, when we focus on on relationality, our, those kinds of fight, flight, freeze responses uh, aren't as likely to arise. And so I can look into the eyes of all of those beautiful brown people, right? And just be like, ah, oh, I see your hope. I see your faith. I see your rage. We're in this together. And also, you know, I have a, a relationality practice, right? When I'm practicing these chants, these chants for freedom, I will try to, I'll try to make sure that I can hear, hear myself and also be able to hear the crowd. So we all know what this is like when we're like doing a chant in a crowd and you keep chanting and everyone else has stopped chanting and you're like, oh no, what happened? Right. So it's just like a little loss of mindfulness. So the practice is how can I stay with myself and with the group, which is what we're trying to practice at all times anyway. Yeah. And just really being with the beauty of a demonstration, you know, again, I live in Vancouver, super rainy. It's, it's always pouring all the time, <laughs> at least right now in the fall. And uh, I was at a demo and I was marching and I dropped my umbrella and there were so many people. I was like, okay, let it go. It's gone. I'm just, I'm just going to get wet. It's, it's too many people. I'm not going to be able to find it. And this young person just like went and scrambled into the crowd and went on the floor and was crawling on the floor and picked up my umbrella and came chasing after me and was like, dropped your umbrella just the generosity, right? The, 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 the connection. We're just, we're like quite beautiful as people. 
And so if we can feel into that, that's so supportive. And another thing that I've noticed is that, um, you know, because I tend to be so weepy and I don't feel like I want to weep at a, at a demo, I, um, what I've, I have a practice now of being like, okay, there's a, there's a little bit of weepiness. I'm going to ask you to take a backseat weepiness right now. Not again for you to go away permanently, but just this isn't the right place. And then I come home and I do a little, a little ritual. I light a candle. I say some meta phrases for Palestine, you know, may you be safe. May you be happy. May you be free. And I let myself cry. You know, and I imagine that the tears are nourishing the earth, and then the earth is composting those tears, and that eventually they come back up into the clouds, like all water does, and they've been transformed into compassion, and then the comp and then the compassion rains down on all of us, especially here in Vancouver, where it's raining constantly. And then suddenly something that's, you know, kind of aversive is this cold rain, like really practicing it as the rain of compassion that also transforms my day-to-day -day experience. So there's so many ways we can work with this. And, and when I'm doing my walking meditation, my protest meditation, you know, just as, just as, uh, as we can't, um, we can't feel into what we can't, what we need to be able to feel um, what we want to resist, we also need to be able to feel into what freedom feels like, right? And we feel that in our practice when we have these moments of letting go and we feel this, these moments of, oh my gosh, there's no greed, hatred, or delusion. And we feel into freedom. Oh, that's what we're fighting for. That's what freedom feels like. And we can feel that, you know, I feel that in, in our, in, when I'm in my walking protest meditation, I'll look up at the big vast sky oh, this is what freedom feels like. So while I'm chanting free Palestine, I'm in alignment in, a, in an embodied way. Yeah. And of course we need to ask for support, right? We know this. We also need to call our friends and call our dear ones and talk about how difficult this is. And it's also important that we titrate, right? We don't always take in all of the difficulty so we don't want to overwhelm ourselves. Again, this is about looking skillfully. So a practice that I've that I have that I think is just a good practice for all, for all of our kind of um, contemplative practices is, you know, what medicine is needed right now so that I can bear witness to the suffering. Whether the suffering is like my own interpersonal little squabbles that I'm having with myself or with other people that I'm ruminating on or something really, really big, like a global genocide. What, what do I need right now so that I can bear witness? So one last quote before we end. From Pema Chodron. Sometimes the broken heart gives rise to anxiety and panic, to anger, resentment, and blame. But under the hardness of that protective armor, there is the tenderness of genuine sadness. This is our link with all of those who have ever loved. This genuine heart of sadness can teach us great compassion. It can humble us when we're arrogant and soften us when we're unkind. It awakens us when we prefer to sleep and pierces through indifference. This continual ache of the heart is a blessing that when accepted fully can be shared with all. Thank you so much for your kind attention. So let's just take a couple of minutes to, um, to practice, to just sit with whatever's whatever's here. And then we'll, if anyone's got any questions, we can, well, there's a little bit of time for that. So just turning inwards and being with the breath.
Thanks, everyone. So it would be a great time to stop the recording. We only have a few minutes left, but if anyone's